Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. This is our last virtual event of Alumni Week, and we've, we've had some great presentations, and this one is sure to be just as wonderful as our other ones. Um, so this morning, we have a poetry reading, and we are joined by um, Sid Lee from the class of 1960. Um, Ian Pollock, who is a former faculty member, and Eliza Griswold from the class of 91. Um, Ian Pollock, former faculty member, is the author of two poetry collections, Ghost Like a Place, which is an Alice James book in 2018, which was nominated for an NAACP Image Award, and Spit Back a Boy, winner of the 2010 Cave Cannon Poetry Prize. Individual poems have appeared in the American Poetry Review, the Baffler, and the New York Times Magazine. Ian is the chair of the English department at Rye Country Day School in Rye, New York, and is a member of the poetry faculty at the Solstice MFA program. Thank you for joining us today, Ian. Uh, Eliza Griswold, is a poet and, a, and she's the class of 91, as I mentioned. Eliza is a poet and a journalist whose nonfiction, nonfiction book, Amity and Prosperity was awarded the 2019 Pulitzer Prize. She is also the recipient of the Rome Prize for her poems. And her most recent book of poems, If Men Then, was published in 2019. She is a staff writer at The New Yorker, and she just moved back to the Philadelphia area where she lives with her husband and son, Robert, who was a new student at SCH this year. And Sydney, Sydney Lee, who was the class CHA class of 1960, former Pulitzer finalist, winner of the 1998 Poets Prize, Vermont Poet Laureate from 2011 through 2015, and founder of the New England Review, is the author of 21 books. Yes, I said 21 books. <laughs> His latest publication is a mock epic graphic poem, The e Exquisite Triumph of Warm Boy, produced in collaboration with former Vermont car cartoonist, Laurelette James, uh, is it Kol Kolchka? <laughs> His 13th collection of poems, Here, which is called Here, uh, appeared in late 2019. Uh, Sid is also the author of a novel, a Place in Mind, four prior collections of personal essays in a critical volume, A Hundred Himalayas. His poetry, fiction, and essays have appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The New Republic, Sports Illustrated, The Nation, The New York Times, and all the major American literary journals, and some 60 anthologies. Wow. So I welcome you all this morning, um, and we are going to begin with Ian Pollock. Uh, I am beyond excited to, to be here this morning. Um, I'm, I'm excited to be with these two poets and, and writers, I'm, um, Eliza and, and Sid. I'm excited to belatedly help Sid um, celebrate being uh, entered into the CHA role of fame for, for his obviously long and storied career, 21 books. Wow. Hope I make it there someday. Uh, I loved my eight years of teaching at CHA and SCH. Um, I started in 2007 and I left in, in 2015, just to give you some context. I'm often homesick uh, for your community. Um, a special shout out to the classes of 15 and, and 16 that are celebrating their reunion years this year. I don't see many of them in the audience right now. I don't, I think they're in their, they're in their like early twenties, right? So I don't think I was up before noon in my early twenties. Um, so no hard feelings there. Uh, but I, I will say that um, I had a chance to teach in this like weird thing that happened. I was teaching uh, in the boys middle school and then moved up to the upper school. So I, I taught some of those students for three and one student in particular I taught for three and a half years so I don't think that'll happen in my career again so those classes have a special place in my heart um, I wanted to start off with a poem that I wrote on the third floor of the end when the boys middle school was there um, looking out looking out the window back at the, the playing fields that were not turf at the time that were still grass the school march each day's festival the rain has let up the school and grounds a shade darker for the soaking. 
to leaves and bark on a holly outside my classroom window, to the red roof, to the red path and tulip trees lining it, to a cherry sprouting ruffled pink across the road, a heavy, dank beauty, a beauty I could not grasp when I was like the boys screaming on the playing fields. The right fielder spills into wet grass while he backpedals to shag a lazy fly ball. And the music teacher, her father dying at mercy fits, walks down the path to her car. Going to lunch, I'd held the door and envied her raincoat while my sopping shirt clung to my chest. I recognize her now by that coat, her face covered by the dome of her umbrella, slick and blue black, saving her from the false rain still dripping off the trees. When she rounds the corner, the wind kicks up, pulling blossoms and leaf buds off branches, and the storm starts in again. Boys scamper from the fields and not checking the road for cars as their cleats clack a stampede on the dampened asphalt, race under the eaves to the gym where they stand shoulder to shoulder, each wriggling in his place as if an innocent man leaned on a wall and with his own sweat dark bandana made blind. Uh, when I lived in Philly, I, I lived in Brewery Town, which actually wasn't called Brewery Town when I, I, I moved there. I think that was a, a real estate thing, uh, but sort of on the border of, of North Philly and, and Fairmont. Brewery Town. This morning, the lovers who last night were slurring and stumbling, and when I looked out, each gripping the other's taut throat in a clench of callus and nail, each forcing gritted teeth inches from the other's face, sit on their front steps. The woman smokes an idle cigarette. The man lounges two steps down from her and leans his head into her lap. Beer cans and husks of blue crab from their cookout scuttle by in the languid breeze. The woman flicks the stub of her cigarette into the street and kisses her man on the forehead. A whir and scrape in the kitchen behind me, a whir, whir and scrape, burrs grating in the coffee grinder Naomi jolts on. I frown back at her, but don't bother to complain about the racket this time. I'm more interested in the lovers, or I was. They're tender now and tedious. I liked them better when the radio was pumping from their open window and they were clawing out under the streetlight the terms of their love. The next poem also has a brewery town um, moment, but it's really informed, I think maybe around my second year teaching uh, at then CHA, it, um, I noticed like concussions became a thing. Like, the, the science of concussion sort of caught up and schools became more aware of, of the danger of, of concussions. So I was sort of, I've always thought about that, that moment and really like the, those first classes I, I taught where like concussions, uh, the concussion protocols were in place. Um, it also is thinking about football in general and uh, focuses on Michael Vick and his dog fighting case. Um, and then I think he came to the Eagles when he came back into the league. on black quarterbacks and dogfights in Virginia woods. When he danced in the pit where boys break boys and those who survive become men who break men. When he soft shoed, boogalooed on the clipped grass, we cheered for him. But back home, back roads, backwoods, dirt and Virginia pine, when he made another thing dance, held it on a lead while it reared on hind legs, elevated to releve, while it strained shoulder and neck against the leather strap. When he unleashed it and it flew like a hurricane at its mark, we howled for the dogs. I howled for the dogs. For the dogs I had known, abandoned in brewery town, in high weeds, in the no man's land along the freight line lolling tongues, 
scabrous flanks, skin at neck and chest peeled back, open to red meat. Eyes watery and vacant as a purpose served, as the eyes of boys sitting at their Monday morning desks, having broken other boys, grasping for what they'd won and finding it in the bell ring of their minds already lost. Um, this next poem features uh, an episode where uh, Frank Steele, the former uh, head of school for CHA and I um, went to a charter school in um, West Philly and I, or in North Philly. And I can't remember exactly why we were there. I think it had something to do, like it was like a career day sort of thing. But I ended up telling this story about my mother who is, uh, who's just retired as a classics professor at Hamilton College. Um, so that informs us. And it also mentions the, the move bombing in, in West Philly briefly. A black mother's child considers his lost dream of immortality. What was she hoping I'd learn? What lessons when my mother, who taught Greek at the college on the hill, read their old stories to me? To be ready one night for hooded snakes to crawl into my cradle, to leave a trail of twine behind me as I walked the labyrinthian corridors of my country, not to raise the wrong sail whenever I came home to her, not to dive as the swan and plummet into a woman bathing in the seclusion of high reeds, not to be the shock and awe of white wings. For me though, the truth in the myth was this, power transforms into life and life forever. And when my mother was finished, all I wanted was to live as those changing but unchanging gods. The white man who taught me Greek hated me. He thought I was lazy. I admit that I often slept through his morning class, often stumbled through his translations as a bore through deep sudden snow. My mother cried when she left me in the parking lot of that place cried harder than I'd seen since the week after her father died. I think she had learned that no black mother can save her, ch her children. Save them as you have proven and are still proving America from your primitive bullhorned violence. And so more days than not there, her son stood beside an aluminum keg fermenting himself pouring into his gullet a river, not of forgetfulness, but of a needful forgetting. My mother wanted to learn Latin on her way to Greek, but her school had her pegged to cook and sew. Short but thick set, the school's own former football hero, her father traded on his glory, the scars earned for it, on his hobbled knees, the slight slur of his speech to demand a place for her in a room of primers and chalkboards. They thought she should scurry about the rooms of your house, America, picking up what you had dropped. But she overcame to stand at the front of a room, professor of language and myth. I told a version of this story to black children at a school in Philadelphia. When I came to the end, my mother teaching Greek at the college on the hill, they rose from their chairs and applauded her in the proxy of me. I think now I lied to them, lied to them while standing in a room across town from where you firebombed a city block to save yourself. America, you have eaten your children to keep your place on the honeyed mountaintop. If you have not already, you will eat those children too and still you will come with wild, ravenous hunger for more. And why do you keep doing what you do? And what will you do one day when instead of a child, you swallow a stone? Um, 
Next poem will be my last poem. Thank you all for coming. Um, I think this is the, the earliest poetry reading I've, I've uh, been a part of, 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning. Um, it's been a lot of fun in, in the works, getting to know Sid and, and Eliza and to be reunited with uh, Jenny McHugh and, and Melissa Brown. So thank you to, to Jenny and, and Melissa for inviting me and, and for hosting me. Um, thanks again to, to Sid and Eliza. I'm excited to, to hear you read. Congratulations again, Sid, for being uh, inducted into the, the role of fame. Um, and thanks to my former students who continue to in inspire me. It's been great to see um, all the great work that that my former CHA and SCH students are, are doing. I actually had Maggie King uh, down at SCH talking about her memoir and talking to seniors as, as they were graduating, which was, um, which was really great. Um, and thanks again to all of you uh, for coming. I wanted to leave on, on somewhat of a, a high note, obviously, um, between the pandemic and, and the, the ongoing fight for social justice, it, it's been a hard uh, you know, 16 months. Um, and this poem was set during a time when, uh, maybe about a year ago, when things were seemed like they were getting a little better after that, that first long stretch uh, last spring. Dance Quarantine. Near the end of my run, before the road turns steeply uphill toward the house, I see a girl alone on her front lawn. The day is beautiful, cloudless and cerulean, the latest in a string of beautiful days. The girl has wound her long black hair into a tight bun and wears brown plastic frame glasses, not unlike my own, and dances. If she is dancing to music, I can't hear it. But then I don't listen too intently. I want her to be dancing to a music only she can hear. I imagine the virus has kept her out of a studio for months. I imagine she has danced only in her basement or to the blue glare of a computer screen, disconnected from the other dancers. Besides plie, I do not have the language of dance to describe the few moves she performs while I run past. In the last one I catch, cubist discombobulation of limbs. She arches her back until her hand touches the ground and then throws each leg separately over her head to, in a movement that would, if I attempted it, break into pieces my embrittled body. Whatever I become from here, I always want to be this girl. Dancing, yes, dancing, I suppose, while people are dying. Not out of callow or callous indifference, but in celebration of the dead. Celebration expressed as survival. Survival expressed as a claimant act of love, an act not native to me, but practiced until it resides in me, muscle and sinew, an imperfect act that is the only one I can think to do, dancing. Dancing until the imagined company of dancers spins and bends around me, until the music others cannot hear renders itself visible in my body. Dancing until each passerby believes again in cloudless and cerulean, again in this day and the possibility of the next. Thank you so much. Uh, and next up, we have Eliza Griswold. Yeah, that was funny. Thank you so much. I hope you guys can hear me okay. Um, that last poem was just so gorgeous. And Sid, congratulations on your illustrious achievement in the CHA Hall of Fame. Um, and thank you so much to Melissa and Jenny and everyone, all the organizers. I'm very honored to be included here. Um, and the timing's a little bit challenging. I am on a ferry um, on my way to Fire Island, but I thought that'd be a nice backdrop and I'll do my best here. Um, and the Ian's mention of Frank Steele, who in my head is Frankie Steele, our next door neighbor. I thought I would start with a poem from living in the rectory at 8030 St. Martin's Lane when I was little and my dad was the 
was the priest at St. Martin's. And it's called Water Table. My earliest wish was not to exist, to burst in the backyard behind the rectory where no one would see me. This wasn't a plea to be found or mourned for, but to be unborn into the atmosphere, to hang in the humid air as ponds bent upward from the overheated earth, rise until they freeze and crystallize, then drop into the aquifer. So I think in this sweet group of listeners who has gotten up on Saturday morning to do this, it's not a secret, but uh, most of my career as a journalist has been spent working as a foreign correspondent in conflict zones, and a lot of my poems reflect that experience. And so um, I am going to read a couple of those. And this first poem uh, is called Prayer. What can we offer the child at the border? Her ripped shoes, her coat stitched with coins, her father killed for his teeth, her mother sewing her daughter's future into a hem, alone but for a brother who shoves her ahead through the barbed wire fence, knowing she's safer without him, a truth she cannot yet fathom, being too young for the ways of men. Nothing is what we can offer. The child died years ago, except practice a finer caliber of kindness to the stranger rather than wield this burden of self, this harriedness. The process of humility involves less us. The title of this book um, is called If Men Then, and it's a response to a Wallace Stevens poem. Um, and it's a response to a line from Stevens, 20 men crossing a bridge into a village. And, and Stevens uses that image as the generative act, like how exciting, what happens when 20 men cross a village into a bridge. And that's, that's a creative act for him. So I wrote a response to that um, called Prelude to a Massacre. 20 men crossing a bridge into a village is not a metaphor, but prelude to a massacre. Marred by violence, my mind begs forgiveness, self-conscious at its pattern of reprise. This old song can't stop singing itself. If men, then. The bright clatter of boots on the slats of a bridge, the mustachioed laughs, the rise of the first lime-washed wall of the village and behind the wall, women pinning laundry to a wire. I'm going to read two poems from Afghanistan um, in response to the, the fact that what does it mean as our as America pulls out and we leave now two generations of young Afghans, primarily women um, and those who work for civil society behind to the to the grasp of not only the Taliban but also ISIS. This first poem is called Goodbye, Mullah Omar. Mullah Omar was the head of the Afghan Taliban. Um, and I think it's, it's pretty clear. I collected a, a, a book of Afghan women's poems um, called Landays, and this is one of them. Wormwood grows on the one-eyed Mullah's grave. The Talib boys fight blindly on, believing he's alive. So again, this poem is Goodbye, Mullah Omar. Charlie says when Afghan men get together, the number of eyes is always odd. A generation of outdated wounds, no longer cool or relevant. The Taliban can't muster the fear they used to. The duffers stalk the graveyard and the chalk, finger their henna beards. They cultivate cartoon. Once a deaf mute pressed her thin to pressed her thumb to her chin like this to warn me they were coming. That's the sign for Taliban. The universal symbol, fear the beard. There's ancient precedent for their love of the poor flattened image in medieval painting. Failure is a sort of prayer. To render perspective less precisely indicates humility. The bowed head knows its flaws. The land belongs to ISIS now. 
No one settles for an I. How quaint, how Deuteronomy. The depiction that matters is inflicting suffering on others. Where are your scars? Where are your scars now? Where are your scars now, Wonder Boys? Okay. This poem is called Pulling Out, um, which obviously has a couple of meanings in English. And it's about pulling out of Afghanistan and what, that, what the experience is like of um, leaving people behind. Pulling out. Exodus is a traffic jam and traffic jams are dangerous. Ahead of us, armed with sticks and rakes, a child's brigade does battle on this doomed track, hourly blown to dust. To occupy themselves, they race a tank. Dust is faster. Tattered surveillance blimps yank against steel tethers over the salt lick plain. The road goes boom again. The flimsy means by which we try to distance war don't matter anymore. Disguise your car, your hair, take to the air, stare down on the terrible mirror of the ground where those who didn't qualify for tickets to the sky wave goodbye, goodbye. I'm gonna read just one more. This poem is called this poem is called Host. And I think all you need to know is that in Eastern Congo, baby chimpanzee is a delicacy and Jesuit priests and monks fully serve chimpanzees. Host. In Eastern Congo years ago on a road locked into, logged into a hill, we drove or were driven one evening to meet pygmies who claimed they were being eaten, which was possible. A woman with my name had watched the fire on which her arm was cooked and then devoured. The pygmies turned out to be lying and this isn't about pygmies. In the truck, we argued with the driver about gays in the Bible as we lurched through the intestinal dark toward the safe haven of a Catholic priest who fed us the baby chimpanzee we'd seen when we pulled up that afternoon, fighting his tether on his father's porch. With that, I will turn it over. Thank you so much for having me and what a joy to read with these fabulous poets. Hello everybody, good to see you, good to be here. Uh, I thank Melissa for putting this all together and Jenny McHugh for uh, being my correspondent prior to Melissa stepping in and taking over so ably. I want to say particular hello to two beloved classmates who I see are online, uh, Tom Lewis and Edward Sargent uh, of precious memory and of precious friendship to this day. You know, as I heard uh, Ian and Eliza read, I, uh, as a senior member, I thought of certain old folks cliches like the world is going to hell uh, and young people aren't what they used to be and so on. We seem hardwired to say that sort of thing. Uh, both these people have proven once again, as they do in their daily lives, that there's no truth to that, to that canard. And I often hear that poetry is dead, but they give the lie to that one as well. Uh, I haven't uh, reuned since my 50th reunion with Tom, uh, my, my classmate and colleague, Tom uh, Lewis. And I remember coming to the 50th reunion and uh, being particularly impressed by the trees uh, out in front of the exchange. And uh, it dawned on me that uh, for Saturday detention, I had planted, planted a lot of those trees. So it seemed like a happy reunion. Uh, I hope I've cleaned up my act somewhat from particularly my eighth grade year when I planted them. Uh, I won't do, uh, I'm only going to do one poem that recalls my 
school experience um, and uh, it, it's a little bit of a bummer, but uh, not, not at all. It, uh, it's really more a reflection on my values in third grade. It's called third grade in fall. During lulls on our playground games, I'd raise my, raise my eyes to the blockhouse building that would close around us soon. I'd shudder like leaves still barely clinging to the oak's bare limb. I'd been breathing in autumn mud that cherished aroma, and I dreamed of staying in that dear chill forever, hoofing and darting. But we were just children, each one of us likely feeling a private dread. We all knew we'd soon have to file as one through that gravestone entrance. Then the third story room, the math and spelling, the endless parsing of those tepid sentences, all of which felt like a sentence itself, against which we had no plea. <clears throat> the season's migrant starlings blathered and wheezed above us, unwilling it seemed to leave. They'd fight the blow, gather a foot, and lose it again. That flock, much like our own, had congregated for a hopeful moment, then suddenly gave in. As one, they seemed to recognize they had no choice but surrender to forces of the own small means to withstand. As one, they quieted their clamor, then went with the wind. This next one uh, is called uh, Blues, dated May. 2020. Great cities flare, another unarmed black man killed by police, but the thin blue line, what else, is drawn to contain the resulting tumult. Meanwhile, as daylight dies in Vermont, I nod on my couch, remote from mayhem and fury, retired and rich, ashamed of my own comfort. And yet, barely conscious, my mind begins to stray from metaphoric blues to sensible ones. Like the wetland iris I behold each morning, the blue sulfur butterflies close to the ground here again with spring. The indigo bunting last week at our feeder, miraculous in its gleaming. Or Blue Monday as rendered so long ago by the late Fats Domino, first record I own. To think of which is to weep, I'm uncertain what for. No, I know, the thrust of time. My bourgeois woes are as common and small as much that I notice. This may, for instance, wild violets galore. You see, little things like that. The darkness will shroud the landscape in minutes and certain creatures will search around for such refuge as they may come on. While others prepare to wreak their blood doused, doused, doused violence, although it's wrong to talk that way. They do what predators do, whereas we humans. Far off, there's a wailing train, a sound that has prompted art of a kind I dearly love. You know what kind I mean. And of course, there's a sky. As its color recedes, I remember a grandchild clad entirely in blue. Last fall, it was Halloween. She was the sky. From her father, she gets the African blood for which I pray to whatever God I can summon. She won't have to suffer. I shiver. I try to will back one of my trances. I can't make it happen. I ache to dream in a swaging blue forever. I would paint the world. But whom do I think I help with poetical fancy? I hear through a screen the beginning hoots and screams. Then dark takes over. <clears throat> this poem is an old folks poem called Scarlet Indigo. <clears throat> Excuse me. By the pond, a maple reddens already in middle August. Impossible. It should still be summer. Falls upon us. Most of the grandchildren back at their schools moves up a year. And the nation, that great gloom blends with less epical fears. Before fall is gone, my heart had a clot. I'm all right, but Steve, dear friend, is buried, cancer. A good deal to grieve, much endures, it's true, yet how hard, no matter, not to sense a shadow as old people do. Here at the edge of our late shorn meadow, small baubles shine. Five blackberries strung, more dark than just blue, on stiff canes gone leafless. 
The barriers should have vanished by now. Brush bends in a breeze that contains a slight chill. Though tiny and poor, it's sweet, the fruit. Even more sweet than when I found more. This one's called Politics 2021. The long-haired cat in my rearview mirror, flat on the tarmac, was it racing for a freedom it would never know? Did it flee a coddled life? Not much I pass would suggest as much. Double wides, two with Dixie flags, pastel sided like cheap Florida motels, appear somehow to glare at each other across minuscule yards full of kids' toys. Everything's muddied by rain. This latest shower darkens the coats of three ribby ponies, I wonder. Do they ever get ridden? They vacantly gaze over paddock wire, but at a distance, they have their reasons. Yellow insulators suffice to remind them electric shock will greet a touch. They all seem well beyond any penchant to fight their fate. The eyes of a tethered pit bull glitter, he'd like to get at them. Now I cruise through town, the dead axe factory, empty storefront, Dollar General. For some reason, a few men thunder at a sign yielding fuel on the opposite sidewalk. One man who doesn't look lame keeps shaking a cane. I don't know a thing. I keep going. I'm a lucky man. I get along with most people I know, and they get along with most they know. Some of us have treasured friendships for ages. Feigning unconcern, though why would those Strangers care about me. I sing along with country tunes on a radio station. So easy to harmonize. The same three chords, every song. <clears throat> and uh, what a, it, Eddie and Tom can tell you, I'm lots of fun in real life. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to turn to uh, a brighter note uh, to close. Thank you for being here. And thank you, Ian and Eliza and Melissa and Jenny and on, on, and on. It's called My Wife's Back. All naked but for a strap, it traps my gaze as we paddle, the dear familiar nubs of spine bone punctuating that sun warm swath, the slender muscles that trouble the same sweet surface. We've watched and smiled as green herons flushed and hopped ahead at every bend, and we've looked up at a red tail tracing open script on a sky so clear and deep we might believe it's autumn, no matter it's August still. Another fall will be on us before we know it. Of course, we adore that commotion of color, but it seems to come again as soon as it's gone away. They all do now. My love for you over 40 years extends in all directions, which is just now to your back as we drift and paddle down the tranquil Connecticut River. We've seen a mink scratch fleas on a mud flat. We've seen an osprey start to die, but seeing us think better of it. Two Phoebes wagged on an ash limb. Your torso is long. I can't see your legs, but they're longer, I know. Phoebe. Osprey, heron, hawk. Marbles under Black Mountain, but I'm fixed on your back, indifferent to other wonders. Bright minnows that flared in the shallows, the gleam off that poor mink's coat, even the fleas in its fur, the various birds, the lust of creatures just to survive. But I watch your back. Never have I wished more not to die. Well, thanks for being here. And thanks to my co-readers who are a great, uh, uh, a great injection of, of hope and uh, admiration. Thank you. Thank you so much. Here, those poems were so inspirational. Um, if there are anyone, anyone that has any questions, 
um, please feel free to put those in the chat um, <clears throat> or even any just comments in general, uh, please feel free to put those in the chat as well. Um, Eliza had to jump off, uh, but if there are any questions or comments for her, we can also pass those along to her as well. I hope she didn't really jump off. <laughs> <laughs> That is true. She she just she arrived at her destination and she had to log off. <laughs> Good point, Sid. Thank you. <laughs> Took me a while to get my sea legs while she was uh, reading. Yeah, I can see them. Um, I do think Ian that um, I, I I do see which I think you can probably see too that um, Mac McHugh, who I think was your student, yes, uh, Jeff jumped on, so Mac was able to see you. Um, Hey, Mac, how are you? <laughs> he says, hey. <laughs> well, I will say is that for those of you that are on, um, we will provide links to all of our virtual events this week. We will send all of that out on Monday. And what I will also do for, and I will reach out to um, Eliza because I know um, it may be a, a little difficult to hear her, um, uh, we will, I will also get the links to her poems so that I can also include those um, as well. Um, but I, 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 have, I have questions for Sid if, if folks, I'm going gonna, gonna to turn this into a master class for myself if folks don't know. Absolutely. <laughs> if, um, so, so one thing that I, I, I see you doing that I often struggle with is like, um, like I think you move in between the human world and the natural world really well. Could you talk a little bit about how you approach that, the, the, the traffic between those two spheres? Yeah, I could probably talk about it and it might be hot air, but I, I'll give <laughs> that, you know, uh, I, you know, I, <clears throat> I was asked at a literary conference not so long ago, where, where do poems come from? And I, I, how do they come? And I, I don't know, they come or they don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, it happens that uh, having been raised in suburban Philadelphia, <clears throat> I left at the age of 17, and but for one year of teaching at Chestnut Hill Academy, using the verb rather loosely, <laughs> I, uh, I left and I've spent most of my time in the woods, uh, no, none deeper than where I am right now in, uh, on the New Brunswick border in, in Maine. And, uh, I've, uh, from a young age, uh, uh, thanks not so much to my Chestnut Hill upbringing, but to uh, my, my bachelor uncle's farm uh, in what is now just part of the Eastern megalopolis, but which was then pastoral country. Uh, I've always had a fascination with the natural world, and, uh, but I've never seen it as a, as a uh, you know, just a big uh, shopping center for metaphors or whatever. <laughs> In fact, uh, I think one of the things that most uh, most uh, stimulates me about the outdoors is that it's it, that it's it's a wonder that uh, that it's not a human thing. That uh, in spite of all the Disney cartoons and whatever else, you know, it's it's. Uh, Every time you wake up in the natural world, you're on somebody's menu, you know, you must be <laughs> at the top of the food chain. So it's, I, I think my view of it, uh, much as I love the natural world, I guess my philosophical view of it is a little bit more like, <clears throat> like Tennyson's and Walt Disney's when he described nature as red and tooth and claw. Uh, yeah, yeah. It is, uh, I mean, uh, at least we kill our prey before we eat it. <laughs> like, uh, we don't. Uh, but that sense of being up against something that I don't entirely uh, understand or even partially understand is, is for all my exposure to it. I don't know, for some reason that puts me back <clears throat> into a condition, I, I don't want to be over humble, into a condition of humility before all I behold. And, uh, and writing poems is some, it's, it's just a struggle to, to overcome that sense of awkwardness or you know, the, uh, do I really belong here or whatever? Uh, uh, so I think that's that's the principal function of the natural world in, in my poetry. Though uh, there are probably I, I know there are many others as well. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think that sense of wonder is, is so important. It's 
folks will sometimes ask me if I will like continue teaching high school because it, you know it can, especially teaching at an independent school can be such a such a grind um there's like a dailiness to it but I just get to I mean particularly when I was teaching middle school but even now that I'm teaching in an upper school just the sense of wonder that that students have when they read a text a, a book for the first time and they fall in love with it and um or they're exposed to an idea for the first time and they're really kicking it around I I I love being around that and it really inspires me and it it reminds me to something similar to, to the humility that you were talking about to be humble and in, in front of ideas and and think about them deeply. What the one year that I taught at Chestnut Hill uh, was enough to persuade me that there wasn't enough money in the world to make me work that hard for the rest of my life. <laughs> I uh, I uh, salute you and others like you, including my son, who's an eighth grade social studies teacher. Uh, there's a relentless uh, onslaught of obligations and not all of them intellectual. Uh, I, I wish to pun him uh, students who were very different from me in eighth grade. <laughs> when I, <laughs> back in those days, you, uh, if you had four demerits, you'd come in on Saturday and do work. And uh, I, I set the record, I think, at 36 consecutive. I think I only missed two. But it was a high education in many, many ways because I was supervised. Wait, can I clarify that? You had to come in 36 Saturdays in a row? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I, I didn't mind it because it was a great part of my education because, uh, and uh, some online will, will remember this man, Lovell Crawford, who was the African-American uh, watchman on the weekends, and uh, he introduced me to, to music and to language and things that I never would have encountered in Chestnut Hill Academy, which was a very different school uh, then, and which is a much improved one, in my opinion, uh, now. But, uh, uh, often, you know, poets get their education wherever they get it. And That's that, right. That was as important as Mrs. Tyler, the school librarian, trying vainly to teach me Greek. Um, I also heard you reading poems about, I mean, as as I was like reading poems about the, the current moment. Um, they're obviously in response to, you know, to things that have happened within the last, you know, 15, 16 months. Can you talk a little bit about about what you're seeing out there, um, and and what the, I guess what the place of poetry is in 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 this in this environment. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, I, you know, I've always I've always uh, uh, kind of shied away from political poetry merely because in writing poetry I wanted to discover what was on my mind, not what I already knew was on mm -hmm. my, and yeah. uh, I, you know I have certain convictions uh, sitting down to write a poem, I, it ends up sounding a little more essayistic than I want it to be. But things have been so, were so intense under this uh, last administration and uh, uh, things are, were and are so intense with regard to uh, uh, responses to instance of, uh, instances of uh, systemic racism. It's very hard to avoid. I might do it obliquely like in politics or in that poem called Blues. Right. But uh, I, I hope, and I'm not exempting myself from, from uh, at all from, you know, I, oh, gee, I'm not a racist at all. You know, I, you know I, uh, that kind of uh, self-serving uh, liberal self-congratulation. But uh, from very early on in my college days, having come under the influence of, of the Reverend William Sloan Coffin, uh, I, I got involved as, as, as much as I possibly could. Uh, in the civil rights struggle. And uh, now having an African-American son-in-law and two black grandchildren, all that stuff comes into a more personal <laughs> focus. And, uh, you know, and I saw, I looked at those the twins, the first two uh, children uh, of my oldest daughter, and I, I, I just picked one up and I said, all you've done so far is breathe and people hate you. Yeah. That's all you've done. I'm sorry to be. No. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's emotional. So it's uh, it's very hard, as I say, to say stay dis disengaged. I, I I can't seem I can't seem to write successful poems if I approach it frontally. Mm. You have written successful poems. We heard some this morning, but you too uh, 
approach it from a from a, a, a slant angle, I think. You know, Got to tell it slant, right? Yeah, exactly. To make it, uh, it just makes it more interesting as art and as a, a gesture of self-discovery. Okay. Uh, we did get a question from your uh, classmate come in. Uh, there was a composer named Ernest, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, Tock, who died in 1964. After his death, a few pages of a projected 14th string quartet were found at his bedside and this remark. Quote, I do not write, I am written. Would this describe your own work? Thanks, Edward Sargent. That's a great question. I, I see why I, you keep that guy around. It seems to me that uh, you could respond to that as well as I could. You know, I'd be interested. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it, to me, I, it, I think it's a great question because it's, it's spot on. Like, I don't, in some ways, I don't view, I view a very like, uh, porous border between art and life right and so it, i'm always looking at my life and and thinking about the the metaphorical possibilities of it um yeah and the the, the poetic possibilities of of what is there and i as as my life un, unfolds there's potential for for writing there i think it's also interesting in like the, the there's a pa the, the second sentence is passive right and the way in which life does happen to us like we control some of of what happens to us but um life is also enacted upon us in in, in some ways um and i think a lot of my poems is, are, are trying to to think about that right like what are the outside forces that um that i'm contending with as as my life um unfolds um I, I'll try and give a Reader's Digest response. Uh, you know, um, we never think twice uh, when when we say, well, the material that a musician works with uh, consists of musical notes. If we talk about a painter, he or she uses uh, colors and tones. Uh, I don't exempt myself from, but, uh, from, from this kind of trespass, but there's a way in which uh, we, we can often, as we teach poetry, overlook the fact that it's a, it's a making. It's not a vehicle for ideas as such. It's not criticism in reverse. The poet had an idea and then he covered it up with all this language. And then you take that apart and you find out what he was, quote, trying to say as if yeah. he had a terrible throat disease or something. <laughs> And for me, um, I, I abandon myself to my materials uh, and my materials are words. And uh, I just, right, you know, the first draft, I'm just writing along and going where the language takes me. And then the fun part for me at any rate, and everybody's different, is, is the revisionary part where I go back and I begin to notice certain patterns or certain inflections. Uh, and uh, uh, and they're, they're telling me, um, I had a I had a a roommate who was a, an architect and he studied with Louis Kahn at Penn and uh, Louis Kahn said, uh, you know, you really have to discover what the building wants to be, and I think it's the same for poetry for me. Oh, what does this poem want to be? Sometimes it wants to be something I don't particularly want to share. Right. Uh, other times, uh, it uh, you know I'm willing to let other people see it, and uh, it it's also. It's self-enlightening in the sense that, geez, I didn't know I was thinking about that. I didn't, I didn't even know that meant that much to me. I didn't even know I knew that, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Frost said, uh, no surprise in the writer, none in the reader, which is a, kind of a fancy way of saying this is a dull party, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't, uh, if you don't have some thrill of discovery in your own process uh, in where the language takes you, then I don't think your readers are likely to either. That's right. Yeah, I think that white hot moment of inspiration when you're generating a poem is, is definitely the most fun part of, of, of writing when you're just scribbling and it, it can be sort of furious and you're, as you said, you're, you're going where, where the language and, and the words take you. But I mean, something I am, try to impress upon my students is that that is really raw material, right? And you need to chisel that down into something that is is meaningful because I've often left that, that those moments of white hot inspiration thinking like, this is it, this is the great American poem, I've just written it. 
And five weeks later, I look at it and I was like, what happened here? <laughs> what what is this what do I have and then I have to to figure out you know what the poem want as you said wants to be and then and, and what what ideas I can can trace into it I I know that feeling of gee it's like waking up from a dream in which you think you've uh, made some noble speech and then when you wake up you realize it was pure rubbish yeah uh, see we're, we're running out of time yeah, yeah I think that's it if I survive, uh, I'm supposed to be at solstice in my 80th year as a guest of Meg. You have such a backlog up there that uh, Meg told me it wouldn't be that long. But uh, if if I make it, I hope to see you there. It's been great to share the time with you. Yeah, I would love to, uh, to meet you in person. As I said uh, in an email, one of my regrets, I have a few regrets about teaching at CHA and SCH, but I think I, think I must have been there for your 50 I was there for some reunion and they, they had you speak and I wasn't able to make it. Um, so I would love to be in the same room with you and, um, and hang out. Solstice is a great community. Yeah. Melissa, do you wanna? Oh, that's not Melissa. <laughs> 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 I think you're muted, Jenny. Thank you, novice. Melissa is normally, she's our communications major. So we usually make her do all, all of our high profile performances. <laughs> But I think that's a great segue is, you know, I think there has been some silver linings with COVID in or, and I think technology has been one of them. Uh, but I would think, I do think there's nothing better than being in person. So I would love to invite you to, to have a reunion with Eliza and, um, and come to campus and share your talents with our students and then our greater community. I think there could be no better gift. Yeah. I would like nothing better. Yeah. I would I would love to any any chance to get down to, to Philly and to Chestnut Hill I would um, I would love I still work out only in Chestnut Hill gear that Coach Aversa <laughs> gave me. Good. We, you know, we love our word of mouth advertising. Right. I don't know how much good it does you in Westchester, but you know. Sid, how was your fishing? Uh, I haven't really done any yet. We just uh, I just uh, got to our little camp a couple of days ago and and there's a there's a lot of always a lot of opening up and and kicking mice out and that's sort of thing. So I haven't gotten around, I haven't gotten around to fishing yet but I will I'm my favorite fishing in in my old age is to take my wife out and watch her uh, a non fisher person for 64 years crank up pan fish in one kind or another so I'm looking forward to doing that pretty soon uh, but apart from that we're just pretty much enjoying the fact that uh, things have opened up somewhat and our seven grandkids and their parents and so on will all arrive soon and it will be uh, a zoo of a particularly delightful kind. And I think we'll savor it a little bit more than we did before, right? right. Because we know what it's like to have it taken away. So thank you very much on behalf of the school. I, I said to Melissa, I think there's no, um, there's no richer experience than having um, a poetry reading as part of reunions. I think it really, you know, we are a school and it's part of our mission. And um, I think it really reflects uh, what we care and, and hold dearly here at school. So thank you very much. Thank you. Happy. I think my first class is having a reunion next year. So I'm, I'm happy to come read for those folks. 20, 2012 was the, my first, those kids were the first that graduated. So let's definitely plan for it, and maybe a day at school, because I will yeah. move the unions back to May rather than June. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to wait for my next reunion. <laughs> <laughs> Every day I get up, I'm tempting the Lord. You know? <laughs> but, so I'll try and get back there before that. Thank you, Alan. Thank you all. All right. And Take care. Said, we'll send the recording out on Monday. All right. Thank you. Very good. Thank you all. All right.